Okay. Everyone okay if we go ahead and get started with intros? All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today for our site presentation for Neonatal Hemodynamics Research Center. Um, for our presentation today, Dr. Shiran, Shiran Moore is gonna be talking about cardiac biomarkers for neonatal encephalopathy. And we have a few panelists, which I'll introduce as well. Um, Dr. Moore attended medical school at Tel Aviv University and completed her pediatric residency and neonatal perinatal medicine fellowship at Mir Medical Center in Central Israel. She recently completed the neonatal hemodynamics fellowship program at McGill University um, Montreal Children's Hospital and will soon be joining the team at Day and Direct Children's Hospital um, Swarovski Medical Center in Tel Aviv, Israel, associated with Tel Aviv University as a faculty neonatologist and will be developing a neonatal hemodynamics and clinical and research program. She also serves as co-chair of the Neonatal Hemodynamics Research Center, trainee and junior faculty committee. Um, as well, joining us from Montreal Children's Hospital is Dr. Gabrielle Teet, who is a neonatologist and clinician scientist. He pursued his training at McGill Montreal Children's Hospital in echocardiography scanning, and also completed his postdoc research training in the pediatric echo lab at Stanford and received his MS epi at McGill. He's creator of the Neocardiac uh, Cardio Lab website um, and is a director of the Neonatal Hemodynamics Clinical Research Program um, Fellowship at McGill. Um, uh, Dr. Regan Geisinger is also joining us as a panelist. She's Associate Professor of Pediatrics in the Division of Neonatology at University of Iowa, where she's Director of the Neonatal Hemodynamics Program. She's also Secretary of the Pan American Hemodynamics Collaborative and Exec Member of the Neonatal Hemodynamics Special Interest Group at the American Society of Echocardiography. Her areas of academic focus are in the hemodynamics of critically ill neonates, particularly among neonates with perinatal HIE. Dr. Sonia Bonifacio is another panelist joining us today. She's clinical professor of pediatrics and associate medical director of the Neuro NICU at Stanford. Uh, Dr. Bonifacio's primary research interests are in the development and implementation of neonatal critical care, neurodevelopment outcomes of preterm and sick newborns, and therapeutic interventions for neonatal encephalopathy. Um, her recent work includes studying the effects of hypothermia therapy and MRI findings and the impact of changes in care practices on the outcomes in HIE. Most recently, she was awarded the Thrasher Foundation grant to perform an RCT of therapeutic hypothermia for mild HIE, the time study across five sites in California. So I'd like to thank Dr. Moore for speaking with us today and for our panelists with joining for joining today. We will have Dr. Moore present um, and then we'll have time afterwards with our panelists um, to discuss any questions that may come up in the chat. For those in who are on Zoom, please put your questions in by Q&A allow us to um, look through them, be able to answer um, more immediately. Uh, so Dr. Moore, I will hand over the presentation to you. And thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, I will share my screen. So um, our talk today would be about uh, cardiac biomarkers and neonatal encephalopathy. Um, I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. I did list here the acknowledgements for both the Neocardio Lab and for Dr. Kim Wintermark, who were both uh, a very important part of the project that I will talk about today. And just a little disclosure of my own is that I'm currently in Montana, and hopefully my internet connection will be strong enough to withhold this whole talk, but I believe it will. Um, so I will prevent, present some clinical cases. Uh, we will talk a bit about the literature and what is known about uh, different aspects of hemodynamics in those neonatal encephalopathy infants. And I will mostly talk about our project uh, regarding biomarkers. So um, two infants, um, one 41 weaker and the other late preterm, but otherwise both quite similar to each other and similar story. And one that is very familiar probably to all of us. Um, and uh, they were both uh, born via vaginal delivery and they were depressed unexpectedly. So this was a surprise recess. Um, they required positive pressure ventilation for the first few minutes, but other than that, both recovered quite uh, quickly and by 10 minutes, they get a decent APGAR score. Uh, core pH is over seven, but not completely normal. And both have signs of 
moderate to severe encephalopathy. We call we put them both as under SARNAT2. Um, and both were started on therapeutic hypothermia. For baby number one, this is the echocardiography done between 24 to 36 hours approximately. Um, if we can, if we look at it, even subjectively, the function is not the best. Uh, the numbers are okay, like EF and, and, and fractional area change are preserved, but if we look at strain, then um, mostly the right ventricle is affected and uh, function is compromised. Topsy is also low uh, at 6.47 millimeters, which is a z-score of minus 4.2. Um, there are signs of pulmonary, of elevated pulmonary pressure with a around two thirds of systemic um, and both left ventricular and right ventricular outputs are low. To compare to that, the second baby who had quite the exact same clinical uh, story and, and presentation has a completely different echo with no dysfunction at all, systolic, no systolic dysfunction at all, both also, the numbers show that in the strain. Uh, TAPSI is preserved. Uh, right ventricular output is, is great. Uh, there are no signs of pulmonary hypertension. Left ventricular output is a bit low, but I think this was actually technically because it's not like exactly aligned properly. Um, two more cases. Um, also, very familiar stories that we all encountered, sadly, in our day-to-day -day life. Uh, we are called to a stat section for a baby that we will know will most likely require full severe resuscitation. In these stories, baby K was a placental abruption, and baby S was a severe fetal bradycardia that was found when mom presented to the hospital, so we don't know how long-standing this was. Um, both infants required a full resuscitation and had very, very low cord pHs. They had low APGARs um, and they had clinical signs of severe encephalopathy and they were also started on therapeutic hypothermia. For baby K, which is our third case, this is the echo. We see severe biventricular dysfunction and dilatation. Um, again, the numbers are not very reflective uh, for ejection fraction and fractional air change, um, but the strain is, is severely uh, affected and compromised. Uh, TAPSI is very low as well uh, with 5.8, uh, which is a minus 3.5 uh, ESD score. Left ventricular and right ventricular output are low. There are no signs of pulmonary hypertension here. Second baby, baby S, has primarily right ventricular dysfunction without any, almost any effect on his left ventricle. Um, and we can see that also affected this time with a low fractional area change and low strain for the right ventricle, but quite preserved function for the left ventricle. TAPSI is also quite low. Um, and here we had some signs of about half to two thirds uh, from systemic uh, pulmonary hypertension um, and a bit of, uh, of a low left ventricular output. And why I'm showing these cases is because these cases clinically are very, very similar, but if we didn't do these echoes and looked at what happens to the function, to the cardiac function in these babies, we would put them all in quite the same categories and they're not in the exact same uh, categories. One last case for now is baby SL, which is a 34 weeker. He uh, was born also in a stat section because of non-reassuring fetal heart rate and a biophysical profile of zero out of eight, which later we found out that was due to fetal mater severe fetal maternal hemorrhage. And the baby was born completely flat, uh, no heart rate at all, um, very, very, very pale. 
So uh, the team suspected severe anemia and hemorrhage uh, on like when they started the resuscitation, the baby was intubated, he got epinephrine and also got um, transfusion of red blood cells through an intraosseous because they could not put in uh, an umbilical line at the transferring center. Uh, the APCAR 10 minutes was three. The quit page was not too bad, but we see that with the first hour of life, he was severely acidotic. And this is actually reflective of the severe anemia that this baby had. Um, and in terms of encephalopathy, he was between mild to moderate, but when we looked at his heart, we were very surprised to see, I'm trying to show everything, just a sec. Um, that also uh, we had significant dysfunction uh, of both ventricles. And I'm sorry, I did not put the numbers here, but both ejection fraction and fractional area change were low for this baby. Um, and I'm showing this case because just a few hours later with low dose epinephrine, we look at the same baby and he has a completely different heart. So it's not just looking at these hard and, uh, hearts and, and looking at the function, we actually can do things to intervene because of those and, and that changes uh, the situation for these babies. So giving those clinical examples, I will talk to an obviously already uh, uh, sold out crowd for that matter, but uh, I will talk a bit about the importance and what we know about hemodynamic assessment in these uh, neonatal encephalopathy babies. So what does the hemodynamic assessment add? Uh, we have already several studies and there are more out there uh, talking about the difference that any clinician performed ultrasound can uh, do to the care and management of these babies and babies in the NICU in general when we as neonatologists do it. And there are different situations, different uh, tools we can use, some more focused and, and also uh, some that are very uh, uh, broad and, and have a very uh, thorough understanding. But what is clear from all of these studies is that when a neonatologist does uh, some kind of assessment, it changes management for these babies and centers that do TN echo and do hemodynamic assessment care differently for these babies and act differently. And that is important because as we said, clinical assessment is not always enough and is not always very accurate for these babies. Um, so there are problems with every uh, measure that we use, and I listed only a few here. Uh, capillary refill is not exact because of uh, peripheral vasoconstriction. Uh, urine output can be affected because of acute kidney injury or the therapeutic hypothermia itself. Uh, heart rate, we expect these babies to be bradycardic, but sometimes we have autonomic nervous dysfunction and that doesn't actually happen. Um, Lactate is more reflecting of the initial injury and we can't actually trend it very well. And blood pressure um, is a whole rat hole. Uh, what do we look at? What are the normal values? Um, and to this, I will show uh, and refer again to uh, the work we all know of Dr. Giesinger uh, that looked in, in a survey of American NICUs and actually there is no universal definition for uh, what is hypotension and what thresholds we should use for intervention. And um, that's why, that's one of the reasons that we need to use more thorough assessment. Um, and- The next task force kind of overlaps with, with uh, a Sorry, okay. And, it's also important to use that because it is related to outcomes. Um, and in this study that we uh, see from Dr. Wintermark's group, um, 
they showed that they took uh, 190 uh, infants after hypoxic in, in ischemic injury. Um, they defined hypotension as a mean blood pressure of below 40. And they had 55 that were, 55% uh, that were hypotensive compared to 35% in that did not develop brain injury. So more babies who developed brain injury had hypotension. And we see that the more severe uh, brain injury is actually with more severe hypotension. And with um, the babies that needed more inotropes. Um, hypertension is probably not much better than hypotension. I don't have uh, studies in neonates to show that, um, but this is a study done in children after traumatic brain injury in a PICU. And they showed that the group that had the highest mortality was the one with refractory hypotension, but the one after that was the group with severe hypertension. So probably either of the, of the outliers is not too good. And our right ventricular dysfunction was shown by Dr. Geisinger um, to uh, be associated with death and abnormal MRI for the short term and also with uh, adverse neurodevelopmental outcomes for the long term. And they actually show that a TAPSI below six millimeters predicted outcome with a sensitivity of 91% and 81 specificity, which is, means that right ventricular function is very important in terms of outcomes. In this study by Hawkwold, um, they looked at LV output and superior vena cava flow in infants after hypoxic ischemic injury. And they compared those who had abnormal brain MRIs and um, uh, normal MRIs. And those with the abnormal MRIs had higher SVC flow, uh, but they did not differ in the LV outputs, which is also interesting. And these are other different parameters that are affected by outcome. Most of them uh, could be uh, under the big envelope of, uh, of hemodynamics. Um, so we saw that multi-organ dysfunction of more than or two uh, systems is associated with death or brain injury. Um, higher ejection fraction and fractional area change are associated with survival. Uh, pulmonary hypertension is associated with more brain injury, uh, lower blood pressure, I mean hypotension and TAPSI are associated with uh, death or moderate to severe brain injury. Um, reduced heart rate variability, this uh, ANS, um, auto autonomic nervous system uh, dysfunction that I uh, mentioned is also uh, associated with more severe injury. And it is also important to choose where to be born uh, because there is higher incidence of adverse outcome when born in centers with lower level of care. And this is also for, from Dr. Wintermark's group. Um, but cardiac function is not only uh, something related to outcomes, it's actually very, very relevant to the hospitalization and, and management of these kids in their acute situation. And for that, we need to know the natural history of and, and what happens. So um, cardiac function correlates with the severity of injury. It improves with time on its own and also with, with therapeutic hypothermia. Um, this is the, again, the study by Hawkwold. Uh, they showed that the left ventricular output of the babies was lowest during therapeutic hypothermia and before that, and was improved after therapeutic hypothermia, but always the uh, healthy controls that they compared to had a better left ventricular output. Um, in this study by Siegel, they compared a uh, longitudinal screening between infants that had asphyxia and normal controls. Um, the asphyxiated infants had lower global longitudinal strain. They also had lower left ventricular outputs and shortening fractions. Um, and there was positive correlation between the strain and the output, the left ventricular output. 
Um, and when looking at research tools that are not exactly clinical yet, but maybe will be in the future, then um, we can see that the infants also have reduced uh, rotational mechanics. So they have decreased twist and untwist and torsion uh, compared to both term controls and preterm babies. These are not extremely preterm. These are like 32 weekers and above. Um, and uh, actually, the preterm infants had increased rotational uh, characteristics, and the HIE babies had decreased compared to the term controls. Um, in this study by Nor uh, that, from a group from Norway, um, they also took uh, hypoxic ischemic uh, encephalopathy infants, and they compared those who had therapeutic hypothermia to those who did not receive therapeutic hypothermia and compared all of those to uh, healthy controls, which are the white circles. Um, and we see that uh, the babies who went through therapeutic hypothermia had better um, uh, strain uh, afterwards, but not those who were normothermic. So definitely therapeutic hypothermia contributes to the improvement in cardiac function. Um, this is a study looking into right ventricle dysfunction and its effect uh, with therapeutic hypothermia. And they looked at fractional area change, TAFC, and right ventricular output. They were all low before the cooling, uh, which is asphyxia related dysfunction. And all measure improved significantly after therapeutic hypothermia. And there was also a correlation between the TAPC and the time to peak velocity uh, uh, divided by the right ventricular ejection time, which they used as a proxy for pulmonary hypertension. So there's a correlation between right ventricular dysfunction and pulmonary hypertension. And a bit about uh, cardiac biomarkers uh, as a prelude to our study and findings. Uh, so in the literature, we, you, we're used to talking about uh, either troponin or uh, creatine kinase. Troponin comes in different isoenzymes, uh, mostly T and I, which are both cardiac specific. Uh, CK can be either the nonspecific total or CKMB, which is cardiac specific. And I put here your attention and like out there and, and because we um, looked at it in our study, but uretensin is actually still only in research and we're not, there's no uh, clinical utilization to it still. It's probably not cardiac specific. We still, we know it causes uh, vasoconstriction and we know that it is elevated in different cardiovascular um, situations in adults like heart failure and uh, MIs and everything, but Still, there is no uh, exact clinical use for urotensin. Um, so when we look at biomarkers, we see that there is a correlation by Sarnat degree. So uh, in this study by Gunas, they looked at 45 asphyxiated infants and 15 healthy controls at the first 15 days of life. And they saw that all three biomarkers that they looked at, which were troponin T, CKMB, and total CK, they all had uh, trends that were corresponding to the Cernat degree. In this study by Lee, uh, they saw that a troponin I of more than 60 picograms per milliliter within the first six hours predicted moderate to severe injury. Um, there is probably no effect of therapeutic hypothermia on the cardiac biomarkers because there was no different in troponin I levels between infants that underwent therapeutic hypothermia to those who did not, um, but it does correlate again with HIE severity. And only few studies that I could find actually correlated the markers of function uh, when how we see them in echocardiography with cardiac biomarkers it, themselves. Um, this is a study by Boo that they correlate, found correlation between uh, low ejection fraction below 60 with troponin T, but not with CKMB. And from that, I will go to our study, uh, which we called creatine kinase predicts low cardiac performance in neonatal encephalopathy. 
And I was very fortunate to work with a great team and, and, and amazing mentors. And I will uh, specifically mention uh, Dr. Annie Lafont, Dr. Pia Wintermark, and the amazing Dr. Gabriel L. Tate, who we are lucky that we have today. Um, so our objective for this study was to correlate cardiac biomarkers with serial echo parameters of ventricular performance in neonates that had neonatal encephalopathy and were treated with therapeutic hypothermia. Uh, this was a prospective cohort study uh, done in our center in the Montreal Children's Hospital. It was part of a much larger uh, trial and a lot of uh, other preliminary data was uh, also uh, presented already in PAS and other forums. Um, all infants were treated with a therapeutic hypothermia for moderate to severe neonatal encephalopathy. And the cardiac biomarkers we measured were creatine kinase, cardiac troponin I, and urotensin II. Um, when a baby was admitted to our center, either outborn or inborn, with neonatal encephalopathy and started on therapeutic hypothermia, the parents were approached. And those who uh, agreed to participate had on day of life two uh, cardiac biomarkers measured, an echocardiography, and a brain MRI. If there, was, uh, there were signs of brain injury on the MRI, then we continued to do both echocardiography and measurements of biomarkers on the third, the fourth, and the 10th day of life. So the maximum a baby could have was uh, four measurements of both echocardiography and biomarkers. We uh, did generalized linear mixed effect models with random slopes to account for the fact that many babies had repeated measurements. We also constructed receiver operating curves to assess the optimal thresholds of the biomarkers um, uh, to assess their sensitivity and specificity. And we also uh, tried to, to look at ourselves and did inter-observer correlation for the echocardiographic markers for a representative portion of our data uh, using the ICC, the class correlation coefficient. So for our results, we had a total of 56 infants that had 128 stain day echocardiography and biomarker measurements. Uh, our whole cohort uh, had a mean gestational age of almost 39, 38 plus 9, uh, 0.9 uh, weeks. And the birth weight was uh, three kilo, the mean birth weight was three kilos and 250 grams. Um, I apologize for the fact that these tables are very crowded, uh, but I will tell what, what is important. So all cardiac biomarkers had a significant trend to decrease over time, uh, while markers of cardiac uh, performance increased over time. And here we see the left ventricular um, markers, and here we see the right ventricular markers. Um, and the fact that all these um, trends were significant indicates that we definitely saw the, the expected improvement of, of systolic cardiac function by the 10th day, as we as should be. Um, this is again, um, this trend over time, uh, just in a nicer way to look at. So here we have the troponin I and CK, how they decreased over time to the normal values and also the uh, markers of function that improved over time. I put here TAPC, uh, right ventricular output and left ventricular output. When we looked at the correlation between the biomarkers and the echo function measurements, then CK of the three had the best correlation with the measurements of cardiac function, but actually not as much with left ventricular function that with right ventricular function. And we know that the right ventricle is probably a bit more important in these babies with neonatal encephalopathy. Um, and when we looked specifically at troponin I, because uh, initially we expected it to be a bit more significant, um, then it did have correlation with TAPSI. Uh, but not with the uh, ventricular outputs. And when we looked at the uh, information from the second day of life, so both echoes and uh, biomarker uh, measurements from the second day of life, 
we uh, constructed rock curves and we saw that uh, CK had better sensitivity uh, with a threshold of about 2,600 and troponin was more specific to predict low TAPSI below seven millimeters. And a CK above uh, 3,000 can also allude to low right ventricle output of below 150, with a sensitivity of 77 and specificity of 62%. When we looked at our inter-observer agreement, then it was considered good for most of our uh, parameters. Um, actually, our worst parameter was TAPC, which uh, is not the best, but it's also like considered um, moderate to good. So our conclusions are that elevated CK and troponin I correlated with markers of decreased cardiac performance in neonates with moderate to severe neonatal encephalopathy treated with therapeutic hypothermia. Um, these biomarkers, especially CK, can be used and actually preferably together can be used with clinical assessment in situations where echocardiography is not yet available and you want to assess what is the cardiac function of this baby and especially for uh, right ventricular dysfunction. So going back to the four cases that I've shown initially, we can see for each and every one of them that actually the biomarkers that we're taking along with these echoes uh, were quite reflective and, and could tell us also, um, at least in, in general, about what is going on with these hearts. So we think that definitely using biomarkers is important when you don't have echo available at the moment. And thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk today, and I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. If other panelists can uh, turn on their videos. Okay. Thank you very much, Sharon, for presenting that really interesting information on cardiac biomarkers. Um, I am curious, are you all you starting to use those clinically? Is that something you're going to be starting to use or do you use them together? So it's still very much physician dependent, but um, that's, that's definitely something to think about. And it, I think it's it's mostly useful in our situation because many of these babies go from uh, very far uh, centers until they get to us, then it's very important to use even before they get to our center. I think maybe I can answer a bit of that question. You know, initially this has been collected only in a research perspective. I think, you know, locally we have readily rapid access to echo assessments, evaluation of heart function and pulmonary pressure, but, you know, there are centers where maybe getting access to echo might be a bit more tricky or time dependent. And so at least having some insight about cardiac injury or myocardial injury may give you some sense about what kind of support you want to give to the patient while awaiting the echo assessment. Uh, not that it should replace, I think it should just augment our understanding of, you know, uh, what's underlying in these patients. I guess a question that I had was, um, it sounds like you're advocating for using these biomarkers, um, which can really be quickly obtained in most clinical settings, right? You know, getting a CK at least at Stanford, it's part of our admission order set for babies with um, presumed HIE. Um, I guess what you're suggesting is we could use these to stratify who we might want to more quickly obtain an echo on. Um, I would hesitate to say, well, if a CK is greater than this and um, the likelihood of having some cardiac dysfunction is, is real, then we should start some type of agent. Um, I don't think you're suggesting that we should do that just yet. Is that right? Yeah, I, I think I completely agree. Yeah. I think these are 
you should be used mostly as as like indicators of which are the sickest babies and the ones that would require intervention earlier definitely all right i have one one question thinking on biomarkers and especially thinking of what happens with cerebral biomarkers what would be the future thinking of uh, with hie patients thinking about a big bioinformatic team and finally come out with a integrated model of echo and biomarkers to 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 try to identify different phenotypes of babies with hie like what would be the the future of or or the classic making studies to to generate hypotheses and and follow your favorite or the one that makes much more sense because now that we have the capability of doing this big like protein expression analysis and what what would be the future of biomarkers thinking in heart and 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 brain Shiran, do you have answer to that <laughs> well i don't have an answer but definitely i think there is a lot of 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 the uh, potential in studying these uh, trends and biomarkers. And, and actually, when I did this presentation and looked over, you know, biomarkers with, uh, with different echoes, and I looked like over a portion of our babies, not all of them, but to my non-statistical eye, there, there seems to be even maybe a correlation with the babies who had brain injury and those who didn't. So maybe this is something to look into, definitely. Uh, we have we know that many things are reflected in the outcomes so so why not this i think the people who would argue you know just playing devil's advocate would say well um maybe the damage is already done so um what is the true value of doing all of these things uh in every single patient with hie um i think you know, babies are not animals, right? Like we, we don't know for most of these babies when the timing of the insult was, um, nor do we fully understand the severity for any individual baby at the time that they're born, right? So I think uh, to do, yeah, looking at the questions, uh, Dr. Cohen says, why bother with biomarkers? Just do POCUS echo. And I think, um, you know, that's, that's all, you know, we can keep doing things, more tests, more blood work, more echoes. But I think the question then becomes, what are we gonna do with that information? Are we gonna stratify our treatments based on that? Um, and uh, it all comes down to whether or not cardiac dysfunction is causal, right, to the brain injury or just an association with the brain injury. Um, so I'd love to hear Reagan's perspective on this. Yeah. Sure. Um, so I just have one comment uh, about uh, Daniel's question also. I think one of the other things that um, is really important to consider in addition to uh, biomarkers and um, other uh, lab type things uh, is the concept of using AI in this population, um, in particular, uh, something like SickBay, um, which is a multimodal monitoring tool that gives you uh, waveform analysis and uh, has been used in predictive analytics a fair bit. So I think there, there's a significant um, uh, gap in the literature investigating the role of all of these things uh, put together um, in being able to, uh, as you guys have already mentioned, risk stratify and things like that. Um, with regards to Sonia's question, I think um, the, the jury is still out on whether um, the uh, cardiac uh, injury is an association uh, with brain injury or uh, something modifiable that can modify outcomes. Uh, but increasingly, we're getting uh, literature which uh, suggests that 
uh, prolonged exposure to uh, derangements of physiology post uh, initial resuscitation, as Sharon mentioned, a bunch of them, but there is a wide array of uh, other studies that are either um, in process or uh, in press and things like that, um, that suggest that uh, association uh, with um, prolonged exposure to abnormal cardiovascular physiology is uh, problematic. Um, and the next step beyond that um, is to actually look at whether modulating those outcomes is good or bad. And uh, probably given the lack of uh, or reduction in cerebral autoregulation, um, fluctuations, uh, big changes in cerebral blood flow, uh, which don't have, which the brain doesn't have the the ability to modulate. Uh, logically speaking, that's probably not a good thing. Um, but I do think that we have uh, ways to go in the literature to actually uh, prove or disprove. And some of that is going to be basic science, as you mentioned, in terms of animal models and uh, testing mechanism. Some of it is uh, human studies that are already underway, but a lot of it is figuring out what blood flow the brain actually wants, needs, um, and at what time point, uh, and then uh, testing the hypothesis that giving it that is uh, the right way to go. And I think to uh, the comment about POCUS, um, we know that the right ventricle is uh, the main driver and the main uh, problem in transition in general uh, with any baby who is sick because it's the highest metabolic uh, highest metabolic demand because of its confirmation, a variety of other biological factors. Um, and we also know that subjective assessment, particularly for mild or moderate disease, is really uh, fairly poor and pretty inconsistent uh, among raters. And so I would um, caution people against um, using a simple tool uh, to eyeball uh, function, uh, particularly in this population, and particularly when the right ventricle is the main driver. And Sharon really nicely highlighted uh, that in some of her cases. Thank just you. Want to make... oh, go ahead, Gabriel. Yeah. Go ahead. I just want to say I agree with everything that was said, and I think you know what Sonia to echo what Sonia just mentioned. You know, like. Yes, there is a driving literature showing that potentially there's a contributor of postnatal cardiac performance in ongoing injury or at least brain recovery. But you know, we don't really have yet strong proof that altering this cardiac performance improves the recovery of the brain, at least on an MRI level or on a biomolecular level. Like I don't think we know that right now. I think the field going more and more towards that way of trying to find proof and better profile infants that may benefit from certain types of therapies in the hope of getting to the point that we may enhance their recovery. And the question still remains about how to identify potential um, patients that are going to benefit from these specific targeted therapies. So we talk, you know, often about patient-centered care or patient-centered management, and more and more, as Reagan mentioned, with big data and SIGBay and AI, we're going to try to create more profiling of these infants, and maybe one solution doesn't fit all. So I think one of the very important key message that Shiran outlined is that there is still work to be done in profiling, profiling the end organ injury of some of these infants. For sure, echocardiography and echometrics and information about you know, performance of the heart on an ultrasound level gives a lot of clues about the underlying physiology, but that is also changing in time. And we know that the elements that we introduce in managing these patients may influence cardiac function and may not reflect truly what's happening on the biomolecular level to the actual organic injury of that myocardium and the subendocardial ischemia that might be ongoing or that happened previously. So if there is tissue damage at the level of the heart, we might try to recover the function by introducing certain therapies, which thankfully we have great 
TN Echo services across North America and the world to help us with that. But, you know, it might hide the degree of the actual underlying injury, at least at the cardiac tissue level. And so to eventually try targets for the recovery of this end organ damage, potentially also enhancing recovery of the brain, I think we're going to have to become more and more subtle in the way we treat these patients um, in the future years. Um, I think we're going to need to be very thoughtful about the types of targets we're going to be aiming, um, the types of treatments that we're going to be introducing, and how we're going to be measuring the impact of these treatments. So we have to be careful of creating more harm in these patients, obviously. That would be very bad. Um, but I think by fine-proofing the targets, uh, and by improving the way we profile risks of these patients, we might become a bit more um, fine-tuned in how we eventually improve their outcomes. I just wanted to say, I think that's absolutely right. And, um, uh, and I think what Reagan said is key. It's the complex interplay between cerebral autoregulation and cardiac performance that is going to need probably decades more of um, lots of data points being obtained for every single patient, um, and then using advanced strategies like AI to help us differentiate um, and ultimately develop treatment algorithms. Because I think it's there, there's so much of an interplay there. And the other point that Reagan made about, we don't even really know what the brain wants or needs, right? Um, and there's, clearly some disconnect between what the brain needs and what happens to cerebral autoregulation. Um, and so I, I think all these things are really interesting, um, but I'm glad we have people like all of you to help answer these questions for the future. Um, there was a comment in the chat about uh, adding this um, as a criteria to uh, decide whether or not we should be treating patients with mild encephalopathy for cool, with cooling. Um, I, my personal opinion as a person who's trying to do a trial in this area is that, you know, I don't think we have good enough understanding of what degree of cardiac insult is really um, associated with a degree of cerebral insult. And I worry that, um, we don't even know that hypothermia is effective in that patient population. Um, so I worry that centers start developing their own criteria for what to do with mild HIE without having a randomized controlled trial in that population really is gonna um, potentially cause harm to babies and their families. So I will leave my comment at that. I think there was also a comment in the chat uh, wondering if actually infants, um, you know, borderline gases and normal exam and that eventually they get signs of cardiac dysfunction. Uh, do we do follow ups and do we do evaluations in these patients? So um, for sure, every patients that are admitted, at least under our care locally, if they don't qualify for therapeutic hypothermia, but there's signs of end organ injury, we do have some basic screen in these patients for end organ injury. Um, they won't necessarily get uh, an echo in these patients, and I would love to hear what other centers do for these, for these babies, but we'll eventually do echoes on a clinical base if there is signs of you know, pulmonary hypertension clinically, if these patients have signs of cardiac dysfunction or hypoperfusion, uh, but we won't routinely do echoes on these patients. If they do get an echo, um, and there is an evaluation of adverse cardiac uh, performance, then eventually they, of course, get a follow-up, uh, depending on uh, what profile we detect on these patients. But it's not protocolized or systematic. One, one question, thinking uh, a lot of times we have babies that if we look at the classic systolic performance measurements, like normal ejection fraction, it's normal, right? But if you do strain analysis or more subtle things, you will find that these babies are compromised. And in a lot of places, the, the only parameters they're going to get is maybe ejection fraction, fractional shorting, and, and eyeballing the RV, as Regan says, might be dangerous. Is there any role there with, with, with the mm -hmm. cardiac biomarkers to identify babies that maybe have classic systolic uh, 
normal for borderline systolic functions, but when you do more detailed analysis of the function, these biomarkers help you to identify the babies that has uh, cardiac compromise. Uh, I can speak um, to fill the void there, because uh, I don't know who that question was necessarily directed to, but um, I think uh, we have a ways to go uh, in uh, answer, being able to answer that question uh, at this point in time. Um, the, there uh, is still uncertainty around kind of normative data in uh, each of these uh, different biomarkers, and if, um, especially as new biomarkers emerge, uh, we do. We will need to evaluate uh, what those levels are, so that we can actually use that information to risk stratify for echo. But um, yeah, Sharon, if you want to add to that, uh, you can go ahead. So I, I definitely agree with what you said. I think it's it's still a bit early to say exactly how we can use these clinically in a very accurate way. Uh, I think we should better advocate for measuring taxi before we measure, we advocate for, for I don't know, for uh, taking uh, troponin and, uh, and CK for everyone. Um, but, and, and as like I showed some of the literature, but there's so many different words and everyone measured something different and like they use different. So it's really, really hard to compare everything and to put everything together into one picture of what exactly is the threshold and what can we use, but there's definitely a trend. So I think in the future, maybe it's a possibility, but there's still a lot to be done. Um, Regan, there's a question in the chat about pulmonary hypertension and therapeutic hyperthermia. Um, with all your work on the RV, do you have some comments on that? Yeah, um, and thanks for asking, Chesia. I actually, uh, we just recently presented uh, on this topic at PAS. And so we do know in animal models uh, that um, one degree, one to two degrees, um, of temperature reduction associ is associated with a predictable increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. So uh, by going all the way down to 33 degrees, uh, you can substantially raise uh, PVR. And for many babies who have um, uh, perinatal hypoxic ischemic injury, uh, the mechanisms that they use to adapt to poor placental blood flow involve uh, redirecting blood towards uh, diving reflex organs, which actually is associated also with redirection of blood away from the lung. So uh, the 10% of blood flow that typically goes through the lung uh, when babies are born following uh, asphyxia is not going there um, and they haven't had it time to adapt to that. So their PVR is already higher than you would have expected. Um, so what we did was we actually took a cohort of uh, babies um, and did echo uh, normothermic and then um, at target temperature with, within one hour uh, with no change in any other therapies and compared pre and post um, uh, pre and post um, cooling. And basically what we showed was that uh, they're all markers uh, that we looked at of pulmonary vascular resistance were indeed higher uh, using babies as their own controls. Um, and as expected, uh, outputs were lower. Um, and as expected, markers of uh, RV systolic dysfunction uh, or RV systolic function were statistically um, lower also. Uh, the interesting thing about uh, that work uh, was that uh, TAPSI index to PAAT, so a marker of coupling of the right ventricle to its afterload, was preserved, uh, suggesting that uh, while therapeutic hypothermia increased pulmonary vascular resistance, as expected based on animal literature, um, and as expected based on physiology, reduced RV systolic performance. And that reduction in RV systolic performance was not clinically significant, although it was statistically significant. Um, and it was also associated with preserved coupling. So um, there's, there's more work to be done in that, in that area. The cohort was fairly small. Um, but uh, the suggestion um, that cooling is uh, 
uh, following the rules uh, that we know in other models um, is uh, uh, as expected in uh, our babies with HIE. I think it's important Reagan. that you mentioned that, Reagan, that there was no clinical um, difference um, because based on the information that we have from all the trials, um, you know, the rates of pulmonary hypertension, clinical pulmonary hypertension were similar between treatment groups in every way that that's been looked at um, and also does not necessarily impact outcome, at least based on review of NRN data. Um, and, I, and I just want to reiterate that because I think some uh, people in the community will still worry that cooling a baby um, may worsen their pulmonary hypertension, and then they may choose to rewarm that patient out of that concern. Um, and I think the data clearly show that that, um, that that A, doesn't necessarily improve the patient's clinical status with regards to pulmonary hypertension, um, but also may ultimately, um, you know, you may be denying the patient a treatment that would preserve their, um, reduce the risk of neurodevelopmental impairment. And, um, and so we would, we would hate to do that for a baby who clearly has signs of hypoxia, ischemia, and encephalopathy. Um, and at least what we've seen anecdotally is that patients who are going to need ECMO are going to need ECMO. And there's no degree of rewarming them where you're going to avoid the need for um, ECMO in those patients. So, yeah, I, I think I think it's really important also to differentiate between the subclinical pulmonary hypertension that we see a lot of uh, when we do a lot of echoes in these babies, uh, which basically is there uh, causing heart dysfunction, but not necessarily causing hypoxemic respiratory failure because of uh, because of preserved VQ matching, um, and the clinically significant hypoxemic respiratory failure associated pulmonary hypertension that was studied in the trials. And those are two clearly very different uh, entities. And uh, whether um, modulation of temperature modulates uh, the degree of hypoxemia in a tremendously sick uh, baby in 100% oxygen with SATs in the 60s uh, is a very different question um, to uh, the question of whether or not FIO2 uh, changes uh, by five or ten percent um, in uh, in other populations, and so we need to be cautious of that when we're uh, when we're talking about this population in particular, um, and certainly um, we're causing more harm than good. Uh, in some um, situations by maintaining a baby with sets of 60. Um, but uh, in the middle, like, like I completely agree with you. I think there, there's, there's no reason not to cool a baby uh, provided that they're not on that store, um, in which case you should stabilize them first and then cool them. Um, yeah, so. I mean, what I, I guess we're saying the same thing is that you're not gonna, by rewarming them one degree or two degrees, you're not gonna necessarily fix that severe degree of hypoxemia um, and avoid going on to ECMO. Sorry, Gabriel, did you have a, a, another question? No, I, I fully agree with everything that was said by Sonia. I don't, you know, there's no at least data from the RCTs that's showing that there's a clinical change or at least that there's a clinical worsening that would warrant, you know, a red flag. Um, I think it's very interesting to see these echo-driven metrics change pre and post cooling. I'm very excited to see the paper <laughs> when it's going to come out, um, you know, because there's many questions. Is it actually a protective mechanism to have these physiological changes? Is it driven by heart rate? Is it driven by metabolic demand? So there's a lot of things, right, that you could wonder physiologically why TH is doing this. Maybe it's actually a protective mechanism. Maybe it helps the heart recover by decreasing you know, the demand on the heart function, right? It could be something promoting actual myocardial recovery. So I think it's very interesting to see these things. Um, and I think there's also a big uh, literature to be developed on, yes, cooling is improving brain recovery, but maybe cooling is actually promoting recovery of other organs too, uh, by 
diminishing myocardial demand by diminishing, uh, you know, stroke work and things like this that you you just you know outline that your um, ratio of TAPC on 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 PAT is is maintained. So you wonder even if it's a mechanism that promotes myocardial recovery of the right heart. Uh, even there, if even if you have increased in your changes of PVR, maybe the underlying myocardium is able to maintain the demand while recovering. So I think there's a field there also to explore. Um, we have trials that looked at certain time points of cooling and certain timings of cooling and certain um, your depth of hypothermia and and we know certain things we know that longer more deeper cooling is probably not great for the baby we know that uh, deeper you know temperature are probably not great for, for for the baby but we still need to fine tune how to promote recovery of all the organs um and how to augment the power of hypothermia um and it's by doing such these studies that we're able to maybe uncover the key to Fine proof. I think Dr. Chalk also mentioned in the chat that by doing monitoring of other modalities like Deniers, which gives you more of an instantaneous picture of some of the end organ uh, oxygen saturation or oxygen extraction, you can also get a sense of the underlying physiology, which uh, although echo and biomarkers is also something that we can capture at a live moment, it's very hard to get a continuous evaluation using echo. Uh, while you're introducing um, management therapy. So it's still a punctual evaluation that you have to do. So having, you know, modalities to augment the information at the bedside can help us um, better eventually target the therapies that we will be investigating. And to your point, um, Gabriel, there is animal literature to suggest that um, certain biomarkers uh, are better um, in a uh, cooled model versus an uncooled model of HIE. And so I think it's very uh, plausible to speculate that there is some mechanism of protection on um, the heart itself also of therapeutic hypothermia. Thank you all for this really wonderful discussion. And Dr. Moore, thank you for your presentation. Any other last comments or questions at this time? I think we answered everything in the chat. So thank you all very much for being here. Our next presentation will be in, in a few months. So we'll send out comments on that. And thank you for all your work um, with therapeutic hypothermia and trying to figure out some answers as we go along. Thank you very much for thank the invitation you, and for the great conversation. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Danielle. Thank you, Shazia. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.